I was staying at a hotel with my mom when I was around 16 years old. We were in town for a concert, and I really wanted to go swimming at the indoor pool. My mom was adamant that she didn't want to go with me. I told her she didn't really have to, and that I could go alone perfectly fine. She was very hesitant though. She thought I was surely going to get nabbed by someone. I thought she was being overprotective and kind of ridiculous, honestly. I got my swimsuit on and told my mom that I was going to the pool, whether she liked it or not. She yelled at me that I was being a stubborn brat, and I slammed the door behind me. I made my way downstairs and through the hall that led to the pool. I needed a room key to get in, and I was glad that I'd remembered to take one with me. When I entered the pool room, I was kind of disappointed to see so many other people in there. There were at least 10 kids in the pool, and even more adults as well. I didn't want to go back to my room though, because I knew my mom would make some snooty comment, and I just didn't really want to hear it at that moment. I set my stuff down on a nearby chair and decided to go in the deep end away from all the smaller children. It was nice because it was a heated pool, so it wasn't freezing like it would usually be in some other places. I was hanging out for around 10 minutes or so when I noticed a man walking all alone. He was probably in his 60s, I would say. I remember feeling kind of creeped out by him just on the initial glance. He hadn't done anything nor did he really even look at me. But he was exuding this weird sort of feeling, you know? It's that kind of feeling you get when you know someone has bad intentions without them really having to do anything. He got in the pool and made his way over to the deep end near me. He was about five feet away when he started making some small talk with me, asking me questions about school different things I was interested in. I tried ignoring him, but he was very stubborn, wanting me to talk to him. I tried politely telling him I didn't talk to strangers, but he did that thing that creeps always do. He introduced himself and then said, well, we aren't strangers anymore. Then he started to laugh, almost like Pennywise the clown. I was getting weirded out to the extreme and told this guy to please just leave me alone. I got out of the pool and actually decided to skip on over to the hot tub. I thought I'd be safer with some other adults around me. I was horrified to see the man immediately jump out of the pool and slip into the hot tub right next to me. He made this weird moaning sound and said the water felt so great with me in it. He also moved his leg to touch mine. I moved to the other end of the tub made a face at me like he was disappointed or something. I sat there trying my best not to look at him and just enjoy being in the warm water. Of course, he had to ruin it by being a creep again. I felt someone's foot rubbing all over mine, a caressing feeling, not just an accidental touch. I couldn't see well through the water because of the jets creating the bubbles was very obvious who it was that was doing this. I looked up at the man, and he had this big smirk on his face. He actually mowed something at me that I didn't quite pick up at first. But when he did it a second time, I understood him perfectly. How do you like that? I stood up out of the water at that moment and yelled at him, calling him a pervert. I told the adults in the hot tub, this guy was following me around and trying to play footsie with me. Thankfully, a few of the other adult men got the man and took him out of the pool room. I thanked them, and they assured me I would be safe in there with them. Their wives also comforted me and asked if I wanted them to walk me back to my room. Of course, I was still being stubborn and didn't want to prove my mother right so I just stayed there for another hour before they all had to leave. There were a couple of other families in there with me still, so I still felt safe. I closed my eyes and leaned back against the wall of the tub when I felt the water shift 
in a way that meant someone else had just gotten in. I saw the man from earlier sit down right across from me, and he gave me that same awfully creepy smirk like before. This time, though, when he whispered, it was a warning to me. He told me my room number and said that if I screamed or made any sound, he would go to my room and do something horrible to my mother. I was scared. I wanted to scream and cry, but I was also only 16, and I didn't realize I had more control over the situation than I thought I did. I sat there in silence and watched in horror as he came over and sat right next to me. He was so close, I could feel his legs intertwining with my own. He set his hand on my thigh. Tears started rolling down my face. It kept building up until I realized I didn't have to just sit there and let this guy do this to me. I stood up and jumped out of that hot tub like my life depended on it. The man was still seated when I pulled my leg back, so I ended up kicking him in the back of the head as hard as I could. The other families began yelling, and one of the women came rushing over. She asked what happened, and when I explained everything, she started yelling at the now clearly concussed man. He was clearly furious. He even tried to lunge at me and attack me. I was thankful when the woman who came over leaned down and grabbed onto his hair and started to pull it hard. Another woman came out of nowhere and kicked him directly in the face this time. And I kid you not, this dude just got knocked straight out. It turned out the woman had overheard everything. They were about to get in the hot tub and do something anyway. And that's when I decided to get up and run. I ended up running down the hall and up the stairs. I banged on the hotel room door and my mom answered. I was sobbing and she pulled me inside. She was frantically asking me what happened. I was able to tell her what happened after a bit of calming down. When I did, she was obviously furious. She told me to stay in the room and she'd be back. Next thing I knew, she came back with blood on her. She told me the man wouldn't be messing with anyone again. I asked her what happened, but she wouldn't tell me. The police came knocking on our door later that night questioned both of us about the events of that day. My mother had already changed her clothes. They never asked her about her involvement. It seems the man had been found floating unconscious, surrounded by blood in the hot tub. He survived and was arrested and taken to the hospital. We didn't get any updates on his condition, and we were glad about that because we didn't really want to know. Frankly, I didn't even care. He was charged with assault of a minor. This also wasn't his first offense. And given the state we were in, I know his sentence must have been pretty long. We were just happy to get justice. Not just for me, but also for the other girls that he'd probably hurt in the past. My mom had a lot of extreme guilt for letting me go to the pool that day alone. I tried telling her it wasn't her fault but I don't think there's anything I'll be able to say to make her feel better about it. I'm sad there are people in the world like that, and even sadder that most of them never get caught. It was the summer of 2012. I was in my early 20s, living in a small town that seemed maybe a little bit stuck in the past. My group of friends and I were always trying to find new and exciting ways to spend our time together, and unfortunately, curiosity got the better of us. You see, we had heard some rumors about an abandoned hotel on the outskirts of town. We decided it might be interesting or even a little creepy to go exploring. I guess when you're bored of your mundane life, even something terrifying is better than just staying in bed all night long. Little did we know that this decision would lead to a night we would never forget. The hotel had been vacant for as long as I could remember. It was a massive, imposing building that stood at the edge of the woods, gradually being consumed back by nature. The 
plants surrounding it were so overgrown that it was almost hard to even find a way in. Stories about the hotel varied from person to person, but one thing that was always consistent was that you were never supposed to go there after dark. We were idiots and figured we had some kind of strength in numbers. So we packed our flashlights and headed out just as the sun was setting. It was really foggy that night. And I remember my friends and I gathered at the edge of the woods. I also remember my heart was beating really fast at that moment. I started getting second thoughts about even being there everyone else was so excited. I didn't want to be the one person to bring everyone else down. As we approached the hotel, our initial impression was that it was just a really eerie structure. It probably wasn't as dangerous as everyone made it seem. I even thought that maybe it was all just a scary story, like your parents would tell you. We cautiously entered the building, flashlights in hand inside of the lobby was filled with torn up old furniture and faded wallpaper peeling away from the walls. We talked to each other about how it must have looked like when it was still open and how weird it was that everything had just been left there to rot. We explored the ground floor, poking our heads into dark rooms. My friends started telling ghost stories to try and freak the rest of us out. Every creaking floorboard made us jump, but we laughed it off as we made our way up the steps to the next floor. Once we were on the second floor, we stumbled upon some things that made it obvious we weren't the only ones who'd ventured into that place. Sleeping bags, empty food cans, scattered belongings. It made it clear there were probably some people squatting there it was disconcerting to not be alone, but not entirely unexpected either. After all, an abandoned building in the middle of nowhere where you wouldn't have to worry about police would be the perfect place to stay if you were homeless or down on your luck. We decided to skip this area and move to the third floor, then onto the fourth as well. We'd heard the fourth floor was the spookiest anyway, so we wasted no time getting up there. The higher we ascended, the more damage we noticed around. The floorboards were falling apart, and the building just seemed more sketchy up there. We were making our way through the different rooms, trying to be careful and not fall through the floor or something. That was when I started to feel as though someone was watching us. I dismissed the feeling at first, I thought it was probably just my mind playing tricks on me. I mean, I'm sure anyone exploring a creepy abandoned location would probably feel the same way. As we reached the top floor, we discovered an open door that led out to a rooftop patio. It was a spectacular view, but something was off here. We all got very quiet. And then, as clear as day, we heard a muffled conversation coming from a nearby room. Our hearts started racing, and we cautiously approached that room. I started to beg my friends to just come with me, and that we could all leave right now. But they were determined to find out if there were other people there. The door was slightly ajar. We peeked in, and inside, there were three men sitting around a small table. It was pretty obvious these guys were getting ready to do some substances of some sort. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but they were clearly startled to see us there. For a moment, we all froze. My friend Alex stepped forward and tried to strike up a conversation, explaining that we had only come to explore the building. He was met with silence, and I could feel the tension in the room growing thicker. One of the men finally spoke up, and his gross voice was filled with hostility. You shouldn't have come here. His words sent a shiver down my spine. I realized we were finding ourselves in a dangerous situation, far beyond what I'm sure any of us could handle. This was their home, 
and to them, we were the trespassers. One of the other men was visibly agitated. He pulled out a knife and started to rush towards Alex with it. Alex managed to back away fast enough to avoid getting stabbed. But the other two men got up quickly to back up their friend. Though Alex yelled at us to run, we all started sprinting down the steps. The wood crumbled as each of us ran, one after another. Alex was in the back, and the three men were not far behind. Just as we were nearing the bottom floor, Alex tripped and fell down a flight of stairs. I watched in horror as he landed with a thud on the lobby floor. He seemed to have been knocked unconscious. We were all screaming. His girlfriend, Beth, rushed over to him. We stood between him and the three men. But my mind was telling me we were all going to die that night. I looked at the men and wondered what was going to happen next. To my surprise, one of the men spoke up. I hope your friend isn't hurt. We weren't trying to hurt you. We just wanted to scare you a little bit. We do it with all these damn kids coming into our house. Here, he put his knife away. We just didn't want y'all coming back, that's all. Get your friend and get out of here. We're really sorry. Just don't send anybody back here, all right? I was looking into their eyes and the little bit of light we had and realized that they were just as scared as we were. I knew that they were telling the truth and really weren't there to hurt us. It was one of those wrong place, wrong time moments. If anyone was at fault, it was us. We should have just stayed away from that place to begin with. And the three men ran back up the stairs. I looked back down at Alex, who now had his head in Beth's lap. She was begging for him to wake up. None of us had phone service and we quickly realized we would have to carry him all the way back to the car. Thankfully, it wasn't too far, just at the edge of the woods. We were still an hour away from the nearest hospital, but we really had no other options. The car ride was hard, and Alex didn't wake up during the whole ride to the hospital. When we finally made it inside, they immediately took him to the back. Apparently, he had a brain bleed. When he woke up about a week later, he realized he couldn't feel the lower portion of his body. He had been permanently paralyzed from the waist down. Beth begged us to go to the police about what happened. She was furious over the permanent challenges Alex would have to face for the rest of his life. After talking to the rest of our friends, we decided to leave the decision up to him. He decided against reporting them to the police. The only thing it would do was ruin their lives. And one altered life was enough for a mistake they never meant to hurt him in the first place. And he knew that. He was released from the hospital a few weeks later and struggled with his disability for a long time. Beth decided to end their relationship not long after. She didn't understand why he refused to report the men to the police. And that decision was the reason they broke up. We were all just happy that even out of the relationship, she honored his decision and kept quiet about the events of that night. It's been a little over 11 years and not all of us are still close friends. Alex and I actually ended up falling in love and getting married later on. Beth is still friends with all of us, although not as close as we once were. Alex doesn't let his life be defined by his disability. That night really changed our lives forever. So long story short, I was kidnapped. It wasn't something I'd ever expect to happen to me, but it did. And it was the most horrific thing I've ever been through. The memories of that day have stayed with me for years later. Now, I feel like I should give some background here. I was 25 and I had just quit my job. It was a boring cubicle job that made me feel like a part of me was just dying inside. 
No offense to anyone with a similar job, mind you. It's just that mine was so boring and so monotonous that I actually started to hate my life more and more every time I went in there. I hated it so much I quit without even giving two weeks notice. I just booked a plane out of the country that left the next week and packed a small bag of essentials, then set off to do a solo backpacking trip. I don't want to mention the country I went to because I don't believe it's an inherently unsafe place to visit. And I don't want this story to hurt its reputation in some way. I got off the plane and headed to the hostel I'd booked the day before. I walked in, and it was gross, like all the reviews had said it would be. But I couldn't afford anything else in that particular country. I got into my bed and fell asleep. I was really hoping that one good night's sleep would get rid of the jet lag, and I would be able to function properly the next day. I woke up at around 5 a.m., which wasn't too bad. I wanted to sleep in a little bit later, but my brain just wouldn't let me. I got out of bed, grabbed my backpack, and headed out for the day. The goal was to try some of the local street food. I'd watched a lot of videos about how great it was in that country, and figured it would be one of the safer things I could do as a solo traveler. I spent most of the morning trying to find somewhere that was serving food early, but didn't have much luck. Throughout the day, I'd noticed a lot of the locals staring at me as I walked down the streets of their country, completely alone. At around 2 p.m., I found a vendor along a busy street that was selling a type of fruit I'd never tried before. I bought some and sat on the curb a few feet away. The fruit tasted amazing, but after a couple of minutes, something seemed really off. I started to feel nauseous and had this feeling of being intensely tired. I tried to stand up. I thought maybe walking around would help, but when I lifted myself off the curb, my legs felt like jello beneath me. I fell back down and started to call out for help. I was going to black out. I knew it. I knew it was going to be pretty bad. Considering that I was completely alone and no one was ever going to come help me, it just before my eyes closed, I saw people pull up in front of me. The door to a vehicle opened and a couple of men got out and stood beside me. It was at that point I lost all memory. I woke up in what looked to be a relatively nice hotel room. There were two beds a large flat screen TV, and a large bay window that looked out onto the city. I could tell we were in a room high up in the building, so there wouldn't be an option to escape through the windows. I looked around the room to try and see if there was anyone else in there. I was sitting next to the dresser and couldn't see the door that led out onto what I'm assuming was the hallway. I spoke out. Is anyone there? Be quiet. He'll hear you. It's better if he thinks you're asleep. I could hear the voice that answered me, but I couldn't see the person who'd said it. I knew it appeared to be a woman, and she seemed to have a slight accent. Who's he? Now I was desperate to know more, but she just shushed me immediately. Just be quiet. We'll both get in trouble for talking. I stopped. I was confused and scared, but I knew well enough to listen to someone when they said I'd get hurt from making noise. My hands were tied behind my back. I shifted side to side while I tried to get free. I made a couple of thumping sounds, but I stopped the second I started to hear footsteps. They were coming from the bathroom. Just before the door opened, the girl offered me one more warning. And you're still asleep. He only likes to play when you're awake. I closed my eyes and tried to calm my breath. What she had just said to me made my heart beat faster than it ever had. Sitting there on that hotel floor, I wished so badly I had never quit my job. And 
I had just stayed and worked at that depressing cubicle, because at least then I wouldn't be here. Wondering what was about to happen. Was I about to be tortured? Was I about to die in the next few minutes? I heard the bathroom door open. Footsteps vibrated on the floor, and I felt the person get closer to me with each step they took. I wanted to scream. I felt a hand placed on my shoulder of town. When we finally got to the house, it was eerily quiet and dark. Except for one dim light shining through a window, we grabbed our gear and headed up to the door, knocking loudly as we called out, paramedics. Nobody answered, but we heard some shuffling inside. So we tried again, still nothing. I looked at my partner, and he gave me a nod. We had to go in. We entered cautiously announcing ourselves again as we stepped into the dimly lit hallway. There was a strange smell in the air that made my stomach churn. We followed the sound of movement to the living room, where we found an elderly man sitting in a chair. He looked up at us with wide eyes, but didn't say anything. His face was pale and sweaty. Beads of sweat glistened on his forehead. We rushed over to him and began assessing his condition. He complained of chest pain and difficulty. Breathing my partner quickly, checked his vitals while I grabbed the oxygen mask and prepared to administer it. We called for backup and tried to keep the man calm while we waited for help to arrive. Suddenly, we heard a noise coming from the hallway. It sounded like footsteps, but heavier like someone was dragging something. We exchanged a worried glance, and my partner motioned for me to check it out cautiously. I made my way down the hallway towards the source of the sound. My heart racing with each step, I rounded the corner and froze in horror. There on the floor lay a woman, her body twisted at an unnatural angle, her eyes wide open and staring blankly. Ahead, I felt a wave of nausea wash over me as I took in the scene around her. The walls were splattered with blood, and there was a trail leading from the hallway into the living room. I stumbled back and nearly tripped over something on the floor. I looked down and saw a knife lying in a pool of blood. My mind raced as I realized what must have happened. The man in the chair was not alone in this house, and whoever else was here was dangerous. I quickly retreated back to the living room and told my partner what I had seen we knew we had to get out of there. And fast, we helped the man to his feet and began to make our way towards the door. But before we could reach it, we heard a voice behind us. Leaving so soon, we turned around to see a figure standing in the shadows of the hallway. My heart pounded in my chest as I realized it was a man holding a knife. He stepped forward into the light, and I saw his face twisted into a sinister grin. You're not going anywhere, he said, and lunged towards us with the knife raised high. We barely had time to react before everything went black. As we approached the barn and corn crib, a sense of unease settled over us like a heavy fog. The air grew colder and the faint sound of rustling leaves echoed around us. Ignoring our instincts, we pushed forward, determined to explore every inch of the property. The barn loomed before us, its weathered wood creaking in the wind. We cautiously entered, the floorboards groaning beneath our feet. Inside, the darkness was suffocating, broken only by slivers of moonlight filtering through the cracks in the walls. Shadows danced eerily across the hay-strewn floor, and a musty odor filled the air. 
as our eyes adjusted to the dim light, we made out shapes in the darkness. Tools hanging from hooks, bales of hay stacked against the walls, and something else. In the far corner of the barn, partially concealed by shadows, stood a figure cloaked in darkness. My heart pounded in my chest as I stared at the silhouette, frozen in fear. Suddenly, a voice shattered the silence, echoing through the barn like a thunderclap. What are you doing here? It demanded, sending shivers down my spine. Without waiting for a response, we turned and fled, the sound of our footsteps echoing behind us. Outside, we regrouped, our breath coming in ragged gasps. We need to leave now, I urged, my voice trembling with fear. My friends nodded in silent agreement, and we hastily made our way back to the truck, the sense of dread still lingering in the air. As we drove away from the abandoned house, the events of the night replayed in my mind like a recurring nightmare. What had we stumbled upon in that desolate place? And more importantly, would we ever be able to forget the horrors we had witnessed? Despite our best efforts to push the memory aside, the experience haunted us for weeks to come. A chilling reminder of the darkness that lurks beneath the surface of the world. As we approached the barn and shed a quick light on it, but didn't really see anything of interest inside, we headed for the corn crib instead. For some reason, I found myself walking alone toward the crib, with one friend following me about 15 feet behind. The others had decided to stay at the shed. I was focused on checking my gun, when suddenly, my friend shouted, Holy, did you see that? He claimed to have seen something move through the window on the second story. He ran up to me, and I quickly shined my flashlight at the window, but didn't see anything. However, a weird glint of light caught my eye on the main floor. As I directed the light there, I was startled to find blood everywhere. I'm getting goosebumps all over just typing this. I mean, there was blood running down the wall from the second story, covering the walls, and even starting to drip and pool on the floor. We wasted no time and got the hell out of there ASAP. Later that year, in June or so, I recounted the story to a girl I liked, but she didn't seem to believe me, determined to prove it. I drove to the house in the middle of the day and aimed my high beams at the crib without leaving the truck. To my surprise, the dried blood was still clearly visible. There was even more of it than I remembered. The following summer, the barn next to the corn crib burned down. The sheriff's department said it was due to a moonshine still gone wrong, and the operators fled the area. But the mystery of the blood remained unanswered, unmentioned in the report. This is not a paranormal story, as seems to be the trend here, but it's by far the most creeped out I've ever been. The ease with which someone could climb onto those air conditioner-like units and onto the porches of the apartments, combined with the prevalence of unlocked doors among college kids, created a perfect storm for intrusions, the reports of break-ins, particularly targeting women who awoke to find a man standing over their beds, sent shivers down our spines. It was a chilling realization of how vulnerable we truly were, even in our own homes. I remember dismissing the incidents as merely creepy at first, not fully grasping the gravity of the situation. But that changed one summer night when I returned home exhausted from a late astronomy class. None of my roommates were home, so I collapsed into bed, oblivious to the lurking danger. The next morning, I was startled awake by my roommate informing me that the police wanted to talk to me. Apparently, 
they had apprehended the intruder during a break-in at our apartment complex the previous night. As they questioned him, he indicated that he had targeted my apartment. It dawned on us that he had likely tried to enter while my roommate returned home late, fleeing through the back door when he was discovered. But what chilled me to the bone was the realization that this wasn't the first time he had invaded our sanctuary. It hadn't even occurred to me until later that he may have watched me sleep on multiple occasions, undetected and unseen. The violation of privacy and the sheer audacity of his actions left me shaken to my core. It was a stark reminder of the darkness that lurks just beyond the threshold of safety, waiting to shatter our sense of security when we least expect it. As I reflect on these unsettling encounters, I'm reminded of the thin veil that separates the ordinary from the extraordinary, the mundane from the macabre. Whether it's the inexplicable mysteries hidden within abandoned houses, the chilling presence of an unknown intruder in the dead of night, or the silent terror of being watched while we sleep, these tales serve as cautionary reminders of the darkness that lurks just beyond the edges of our perception. Yet, amidst the fear and uncertainty, there is also resilience. We find solace in the bonds of friendship, the comfort of shared experiences, and the determination to confront the unknown with courage and resolve. And though the shadows may loom large, and the night may hold its secrets, we press onward, guided by the light of our own convictions and the unwavering belief that even in the darkest of times, there is always hope. So, as we bid farewell to these chilling tales, let us carry with us the lessons learned, the memories forged, and the understanding that in the face of adversity, we are stronger together. For it is in the darkness that we truly discover the light within ourselves.